Yeah, so welcome to this uh, next lecture in Python. So we will continue from where we started last time. Uh, so we went through the data types, the lists and dictionaries, and now we're going to go through uh, loops and conditional statements. And uh, to do that, uh, I will repeat again the structure of Python again with the code blocks. So in Python, everything, instead of using begin n or curly brackets or anything else to define blocks of code, blocks of code are, are defined by an indentation. So in this case here, we have a for loop. Uh, and what is supposed, what is going to be looped is in a code block. And the code block always starts with a colon at the end of the statement. So a, a function, is the, which we'll go through also, is uh, defined by function definition and then a colon and a code block. So in the loop here we have a colon and this is an indented part. The, the print statement here is indented, therefore it's part of the for loops code block. You can have multiple statements here that are indented. They are all part of the code block that is executed. This print statement is not part of the code block. So it will first print out this one and then this one is outside. So this will not be repeated. So if we run here, you can see here that it repeats the print statement here, and then, uh, which is part of the code block, and continues here. So I can also put a code block additional statement here. And you can see here that it will use this statement as well as part of the code block for the for loop. So both of these statements will be repeated five times here. So uh, one fundamental uh, building block of programs is uh, loops. We have to repeat code a given number of times. Uh, in Python, you can do that using the for uh, statement. Uh, and you can do, there are several ways of doing this. The, the classical way that is, you can compare to C++ or Fortran is the for i in range construct. So here you have four, and then this is the loop variable that will change over the when you're looping, range gives the range in which to loop. So if you have range 10, it will generate a sequence from zero to nine. So I'm going to print it out there. You can also have a sequence that starts at a different starting point. So five here in this case. And then the, the same notion that we had before with indexing uh, last time, but this is, will go from five to 10. So this one will not be included in the range the last item. And then you can have three parameters to range. So start, end, uh, and then the step size. Running this will produce a sequence of 10 numbers starting from zero. This one here will start from five and go up until 10. And this one here will uh, get start from five and then Jump with three, uh, the step uh, length three, so five, eight, 11, 14, 17, 20. But, not, um, uh, um, but it should be less than 21. So, this kind of loop you, you would need when you need to have a loop index that you want to do in your code book. You want to use that i for something in the computation. If you don't want to use, don't, don't require a loop index, you can, you, there are other ways of looping in Python as well. So for example, if you have a list of values like this, I want to loop over all the, all the values. I'm not really interested in what the index position of, of the item in the list is. I just want to process the item. Uh, you can do instead for value, and then you use in values. Then value will be the, the start with the first item in the list, and that will be give a reference to that, that uh, value. And then the next loop iteration, it will be three, six, four, and the string here, and, and, and so on. So you can loop over values in the list. So same thing, but you don't need an index. You could, of course, have an index and then use the index to uh, retrieve values from the list. That's also possible. Uh, but just looping or iterating over lists or data structures, you don't require an index variable. 
you can, as I said, you can loop over a list uh, using uh, the index as well. So in this case, if we want to construct a loop over a list for i in, then we have to create a range and a range that is uh, the size of the list. So we can use the len function here to query the size of the list. And then we can loop over, and then we can retrieve the values here from a, y, i, and b, y. So we can actually loop over two lists at the same time using this, um, having the, the index available to us. There's also another way of um, uh, looping over lists. So you can have for i a value here. So if you both have want to have the value directly without using the index to retrieve the value, you can use the enumerate here. That will create uh, one i. Uh, so i will be the position here in the list and value will be the actual value. So in this case, you can get the number automatically here. So you actually don't need to use range. You can just use enumerate instead. So you see here, you get the index here, and you get the value directly by using this construct. But of course, you have more ways of iterating over lists. Uh, so if I have two lists like this, so this is our example coordinate positions, I want to loop over both of them. I can use the sit function here to pair them together, and you can loop them over here. So for x comma y in zip, then x y will be, be first iteration with 50, 50, and then 130, 70, 200, 220, and so on. Uh, so it's this way of looping over multiple lists with the same length. And also, you can just to kind of see what the zip function does, you can do it like this. So uh, zip actually doesn't create a list. It's a uh, virtual uh, construct, but you can actually see how it's constructed using uh, converting the zip to a list. You can see here that you get a list of pairs, tuples like this. So what we are looping over here is actually the tuples and X and Y will be assigned these two values first, these two values next, and so on. Uh, you can also iterate over, so, so if you have a nested list like this, you have values here, lists of lists, and you want to iterate over all values in this structure, regardless of, this, of the, if they are in pairs or not. You can first loop over the points like this, so this we call this inner list for point, so P in points. So every time we iterate, we'll get one of these lists here. And then we can do for chord in P, and then we loop internally here from this one to this one. And we can print them out like this. And you can see the code structure here. We have a for loop here, and we have a code block that is for this outer loop here that is indented. And then we have a nested loop here that is this code block here. So in this way, you can, the, the indentation controls the actual loop, the, the code blocks. So the, the, the code block for the outer loop is this one here. The code block for the inner loop is just a print statement. So dictionaries, those are not uh, a bit different, but you basically do the same thing when you iterate over dictionaries. So here I have a dictionary here of phone numbers for different people. And I can do four key from a value in name dict item. So there is a special method on the dictionary called items that control that contains the key value pairs, which you can loop over. So if I loop over this one, you get the key and you get the value of this. If you're only interested in the keys, there is also a method called keys that returns you a list of all the keys and you can loop over that one. Yeah. 
Um, but if you want to search things in the dictionary, don't use the looping techniques. Then you lose all this, all the performance because you can actually, if you want, just want to query if uh, one of the names here is in a dictionary, you can do using the in statement. If something is in the dictionary, that is much quicker than looping over on the search. So uh, looping over a dictionary is mostly if you want to save a dictionary, you want to write it out and present it, then you loop over everything. You can also loop using the while statement. Uh, so while statement is while, and then there's a condition here that has to be fulfilled uh, to, to uh, execute this uh, loop here. So if this is false, it will exit the loop and uh, continue after the, uh, the null statement. You can see it iterates over and then it terminates at some point. So this is, uh, if you do more uh, algorithms in, in computing, the Y statement could be useful in that, in that case. Uh, then we need also to be able to take decisions in your code. And that is done we're using the conditional statements. And uh, the most common one is the if statement. It's using the same concept here. So have, you have the if statement, the condition that should be fulfilled if the code should be executed. And you see yeah, I have a colon here again, and then the indentation here again. Uh, And if you, you can also use an else here, so you have a if true, then this code block is executed, else this code block is executed. And then you can also have uh, many, so if here and then have else if, then this is, if this is true, then this is executed, else if this is executed, if none of the above, this one is executed. And, and also you can nest them. So if you have a statement like this, so if, if this is true, this is executed. Else, the entire, you have this statement inside a code block. So if this is false, it will evaluate this inside code block. So you have to think about the indentation in Python. It's really important. So preferably if you have an editor, set it to a fixed number of characters for the tab. So for example, four, uh, and make sure that you always use the same indentation because if the indentation is wrong in the code, you can get strange errors that inconsistent indentations or from, from the Python interpreter. So it's important that you have the same indentation all the time when you're consistent. And also don't mix tabs and spaces. So choose the classical argument in programming if you use tabs and spaces. But use either, don't mix. That's my tip. Then of course, if you if you are have a loop and you want to, uh, you realize that I, I want to break out of this loop, but I want to stop looping, uh, or go to the next iteration. There are some special statements that you can use. So in this case here, break that will break out of this outer loop here and continue out to the code block. There is also a possibility to use continue that will go to the next iteration of the loop. So here you can see, go to the next iteration here, continues, and then it continues from, it doesn't print five here, but it continues, and then it goes to number six iteration, and then exits the loop here. So it never comes to 20. Functions and subroutines. So to be able to uh, construct a larger problem or bigger algorithms. It's very useful to be able to uh, group, group function, group code into logical functions that you can call, uh, uh, so that it's easier to understand. Uh, and in Python, you can define your own functions using the def keyword uh, followed by a function name, and then the parentheses here to define which parameter you need. So a function that doesn't have a parameter looks like this. Print doc and it 
have some empty parentheses. Same notation as with code books, so a colon here again, indentation, and then the, the, the statements that are part of the function. So if I run this, nothing happens. Because the only thing that happens now when I run this is it defines this function and makes it available in my current scope. So it's very review, but, but now it's it's defined, so I can, I can use it. So I can run it just by calling the function name and a parenthesis, and it will call this function. And now you see it jumps up here and executed the statement. You can have parameters. You just list them here in the parenthesis section here, as many as, as, as we like. And also, because Python can have, a variable can have any data type associated with the, the reference. So in this case here, I do a trick here. So this function actually can handle any input type because I convert here using the string function in Python, the variable reference here to a string representation. So in this case, next case here, I do a b equals 42 and I print, I call my function here to print my value. So for I did this one. That's, and you see it prints out 42. I could have used a floating point value here. That will also work. I can even do a true, then it's a boolean. And I can pass a string. But if I ha hadn't used the str here, um, if we will have a problem here, because then, then it expects it to be a string because of a plus sign here. So changing parameters in function and delivery with a question mark here. So if you look at this function here, in, in other languages such as Fortran, uh, this assignment here would actually uh, uh, change the variable reference to A. But if you look, if I you know, test this here, define this function, we do B equals 42, we pass the B into the function here, and we'll see what happens when we, what we get back. So print B, A here is the, actually the B here in this case, and we print it out and it seems to be 42. And then we change it A here to 84, as, as we think we do. But if we print out B, nothing has changed. Because what happens here is that A here, if we do this assignment here, A is a variable reference that is only available in, the, in that function. So actually we are reassigning, creating a new variable reference A, but it's not the same as that one. And uh, now this will not pass out from the function. So in Python by default, everything is passed by value in the, the parameter list here. So how do we get things out from the function? So in Python, we need to use return values. Uh, so there is no distinction in Python from, from a subroutine that has no return values in the function. They're all defined by the def here. So in this case, we have a def f of x here, and uh, we define a function that returns the, the sign of x. So the, we use the return to return things out of the function. Uh, you can also return multiple things using the tuple notation here. So x comma x divided by two to return two uh, variables out, two references out from the function. So here I uh, define x and y, and then I call my function here and assigns y to the return value of the function. And here you can see I can assign x and y, uh, and from this value here to return, assign both x and y. So. All right, but to now, if you pass a list, that is also passed by the references passed over. 
But in this case, you can actually modify the values inside the list uh, because the list is a reference, contain references to, so you pass over the reference to the list. If you be zero or two, you can actually use the function to modify the list. So this is possible because B points to a list in memory. And if you do B here, zero, you can actually change the values into that reference of the list. And then, so, so list passing list, you can actually modify in function. Uh, also, uh, in Python, when you have a lot of functions, uh, it also often is usually a good idea to kind of uh, group them into logical modules. And in Python, this is really simple. So every source code file you can define the .py file is a module itself. And the name of that module is the file name, not the extension. So if you define my module .py, the module name is my module, and you can use it in, like any other module in Python to, uh, to use. So modules are code of, uh, Python code that are collected, and Python comes with a lot of built-in modules, um, and you you uh, import or tell Python that they want to use a module using the import statement here. So in Python there is a special module called math with all the mathematical functions. And if I want to use them, I do import math, and then I have access to all the functions in that module. There is, however, using math in this way could be that you have to, every function you use, you need to kind of prefix with math. So if you don't want to use that and you want to use the math function directly, you can do that as well. Then you can use another form of imports, it's called the from from import statement here, so you have from math import star. Then it will take all the functions in math and put them in a current context. So it, uh, so the sim function will be available directly without the, the prefix here. Um, and for some things that could be more useful. However, this has a really one problem is that uh, if, for example, the NumPy module will be looked at in, in the uh, next lecture, next hour, uh, it's also provide math functions. So if you do from math import and then you do from by numpy import star, uh, all the functions from math here that have the same name would be overwritten by numpy. Uh, and that could be not always that you realize that you actually overlap in the functions. And uh, so it's this is a bit discouraging in Python to use this kind of imports unless you have really you know what you're doing, you, you only want to use math in this case, then it's no problem. Uh, but usually you do it a bit different. Instead of, for example, if you only want to use the sine and square root functions, you can do from math import and you just import sine and square root and nothing else. So that is also possible. Uh, as I said, all Python sort of can be used as modules. Uh, so for example, here I have uh, defined um, this, this code here is stored uh, as a module called prime.py. Uh, it itself imports a module, the square root function, defines a function called prime, which calculates prime numbers. So as this, I'm running this in a notebook, it's a bit difficult to, um, I need to actually download this module have it available locally here. Uh, and now this module is available in my directory. So it's in my same directory. And if I do import prime, it will read this file here. So it will look for a file called prime.py, import it, and make it available. So now the, the function we have is prime, is available prime dot is prime, and then call it. So let's see if it works. Yes, and then we run it here. So you can see when, when I imported here, I actually had a, okay, that was simply a print statement in that moment here. Um, so in this case, you can, uh, the function is available by the prefix prime. 
You could also have done the, the from import to get to its prime function directly. Uh, but this is more clear. Then you know, okay, this I will call a function in the prime module. It's called this prime. It's very clear to the reader what, what you want uh, to call and where it's located. Then we come to something else. In Python, there is no notion of a main program itself. So Python, if you have a Python script, you can run it through the Python uh, um, interpreter and it will run. Uh, but as you see here, you can both import and you can run stuff. And sometimes you need to kind of uh, make sure that the code you want to run, when you import a module, every, every code in the module will be run. And, and sometimes you don't need it, you only want to define the functions. So in many other languages, you have a point of entry for the main function, and you can do that in Python as well. Uh, so if you run Python source code file, uh, that file, uh, there's a special uh, variable that is defined automatically when you run or import. And if you print name when you import a module, name will contain the module name. If you execute it as a script, it will contain uh, the name main. In this case here, um, I don't know this one. I have a prime main function. So if I import, so I, you see here, I have a, there's a print statement here, print name. So if I do an import here of that function, it will print prime export. If I run this as a script, like on a command line, you type Python and script name, it contains main. So using this, you can determine if, if the, uh, the primal file has been executed as a script or import as a module. Because then you can say, okay, this is main program, so you should stop my execution. Uh, but you can also use the module to import, and then it, then it will not execute. So what you see often in Python code is construction like this. So if you have a main main uh, source code that is that starts your program, uh, you do something like that. So import prime that is our main program module. We have an if statement here. So if name equals to main. That is true when you execute it using the Python interpreter, not import. This will be false if you import this file uh, in another code mode, and then this will not be executed. So here you can put the start execution of your code uh, when you execute this file. It will execute these two lines of code. But if I import it, those will not be executed. So if I run it, it will print out those two statements. If I import this function, nothing happens. So this is a way to, in many, many uh, Python modules also have this functionality that you can uh, test how the module, if, the, if it works. You put, every module has an if statement. And if you run the module, it will run some test statements to validate the functionality of the module. So that is also something we use this. But one recommend if you have a starting point of your project, so there is a single source code file that is kind of the where you start your execution. You should create this structure here. It's not required, but it's uh, something that you can see in many Python code that are doing that. So, so um, you have seen before that. Uh, to print out data on the, on the console or in, in, the, in the terminal window, uh, you use the print statement. And uh, in many cases, you need to print out or write to files uh, in a more formatted way. And there are a lot of functions in Python for formatting scripts and, and uh, make, making sure that you print out in a nice way, for example, creating nice tables, creating you know, uh, certain precision on the floating point values. And there is some, so every string in Python is an object and it has several methods connected to it. So there is one called format here. Uh, and then you can create a kind of template of how you want it to print out. 
So in this case, every curly bracket here will be replaced by a variable value. And it will take A, put it in the first one, replace that curly bracket with A, B, C, and D. This kind of this is not the most useful format string, but it's uh, so what it does here is you have a, the comma signs here. That is, I want the values with the comma sign between them. Could have done something like this instead. So dash. And then you can see it has dashes here between the values. So it's, it's a way of creating a template of how you want your output to be constructed. It's also possible to rearrange the ordering. If I have A, B, C, and D, I can give them number here. Zero will be the first value, one will be the second value, and two, and so on. Like that. Uh, of course, you want to be able to control also how, how the output from, from this string is placed here. Uh, so I just put uh, greater than and less than here to show where the string, um, how the output is actually constructed from this curly bracket. So in this case here, I put colon 15. That means I want to have a text field that is 15 characters long. And I want to place this string in, in that, um, replace that with the string. Here. So if I run this, you can see here that it, the actual string that is created here has 50 characters in it, and it places this string on the left side by default. We can control the alignment using uh, the greater than sign here. If I want it on the right side, I put the greater than sign here, so points to the right side. Then the output will be like this. So I will add spaces here and put the string on the right side. So it's similar if you're working with Excel, you can write justify, left justify in, in your cells. You can also center by using the, this character here, circumflex or something. Then it will be centered in that field. So you can see it's outputs in the middle. You can also specify if you want uh, the, the, the field character not to be spaces. You can see here I put an underscore here before, then that will be used as the field character. See it has underscores here. So you can have stars or whatever. We will keep that. To fill up the field. You can also um, tell what data type is to be expected here. So in this case, I put D here, that is for integers. And you put 42 here, and it will format it as this one. And you can then uh, also change the field size here. So here I have um, 10D, that means I want an integer field of 10 characters wide. And then I can do, do all my formatting things that I did before to print them out. Here, left. That is the, uh, the right is the fault for integers. Uh, this is just explicit. So that we have left side, middle with a different field character. You can also have, uh, sometimes you want to have a zero, zero, one, four, or something. Then you can fill out the zeros as well. That's quite powerful. Floating point is probably the most where you need to do more that you actually need this. So here you can have. You have a field that is divided by, we have two uh, field uh, parameters here. So the, the field width and the number of decimal places. So this will print out on the, in a field size of 10 characters using two uh, decimal points. So you can see here two, four, and six. They're also by default uh, right justified. So, so the F here is a fixed form floating point. So that is, uh, does not use the scientific notation. If you want to use the scientific notation, you use the E here for formatting. And then it's displaced using the two 
decimal points, and then it adds this sample notation here as well. Another thing you can do is uh, actually, instead of using numbers in, in the templating here, uh, you can use actually names or variables. So x comma y here, it will take x place, place there and y will be placed there. Another nice, nice thing is that you can use, if you have a dictionary with values or sort of key value pairs, you can use the keys directly in this formatting string. And then you have to use this new notation here. You need to also double star params here to do this. But then it will take the values directly from this dictionary here and, um, and replace them in the string. Another thing in Python that is also worth knowing. So there is a global function called globals which contains all the variables as a dictionary. So everything in Python, every variable, every function, every clause you define is actually defined in a dictionary, global dictionary. And you have, you have access to it by using the global function. It will return you that dictionary. So let's see what we have here in our dictionary. So you can see here we have this main book. Um, if we scroll here, you can see we have all the variables to find all the code in a dictionary. What you can use with that is actually a shortcut when you do format. I have value one, two, three as variables, uh, and I put them as name variables here in my formatting statements, and I just put globals in here. And it will take the values from the global settings and put them in your string. So another important thing to, which you need when you design your program is the ability to read and write files. Um, the files are, are a collection of data stored on disk that you can uh, you can create and you can read. And in Python, to you to work with files, the key is to use the open statement. The open statement uh, opens a file on disk and returns a file object which you can work with to write to that file. So if I want to open a file, uh, my file of text and I have a new file, I want to write to it. I have two parameters. This is a file name. This is uh, what you want to do. So if there is a string with a W, that means I want to write to this file. And when I when I execute this command, the, uh, the, the text file object will be created, and that is a reference to my file on disk. So if I want to do something to this file, I use the text file object. And if I want to write things to the file, you use a method called write. And you specify what you want to write to disk. And it doesn't work like a print statement. So this will work like a type on your in, in Word. So if you type text, this will kind of type this text, uh, this will type this text. It does not automatically go to the next line. So it will just continue writing here. And this will continue writing out for this here. But if you put a backslash N here, it will go to the next line in the file. And then we continue here. So now I have an open text object and I will execute the statements. Uh, and then I will, when I'm done, working with file, it's very important that you use the call the close method here. That tells the operating system, I'm done with the file. And then um, it knows, uh, it actually writes the file down because many of modern operating systems today, they, they don't write directly to the, to the disk. They cache many of these operations, uh, writing to, to the files uh, to a suitable position. For example, when you are not working with your computer or it's idle, it's, it writes down in the background. What close does, it says that, okay, this file is, we are done working with the file. Please write it down as soon as possible. If you don't do that, you have a lot of open files in the operating system. And uh, if you close the program, it's not, it's not sure that the, the, the files will be written down. So it's important that you kind of have, take this habit to always close files. You can also put a lock on the file so that somebody else can't open the file. 
So it, it's important that we do close. So we close the file. And now we oh, do cat here. So this is actually not a Python command here. Yeah, this is uh, the exclamation means that I want to call the system command in this uh, notebooks Python interpreter and just display the contents of this file. You can see here, this was printed here and we continue to write here. Then there was a new line, and then this text uh, came on the next line. So this is the contents of the file. Reading is the same thing, but just backwards. So if you want to open a file and read the contents into Python, you do, you do the opposite. You create the file object again, but you put a read statement, read parameter here, R. That means that you can only read from those files. And Python has a lot of ways of reading things into a file. So if we start here, this is text file dot read. This method here will read the entire file and put it in a string content. Uh, if you have gigabytes of files, this is not recommended. Uh, so this is just recommended for smaller things because it will read the entire file and probably fill up your memory with uh, gigabytes of, of things in this string. There is no limit on how large strings can be, but it's not recommended. But for smaller things, it can be perfectly fine. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And you can see here, if I print the contents here, this entire thing is in my string, including the backslash ms. So it, it reads the entire thing, stores in the string, and I can use it here using print content. So if you want to read a file more efficiently, or you want to process the file uh, line by line, for example, you can do it like this. So Open my file, read again. Line equals the text file dot read line. It reads one line up until there's a backslash n. Stores that in a string. And if, if it comes to the end of the file, it will return an empty string. So if line not equals to an empty string, it will kind of iterate over here, continue reading, then we close again. And you can see here that when I print out each line, you can see there are, there's a strange space between here. So this is because when you do a print statement, it will actually add an additional backslash n. And as the first line contains backslash n, you will have two line breaks. It will jump down. If you don't want that, you can use the strip function that we talked about yesterday here to clean up the string here. So text file read line dot r strip. It will remove the trailing stuff in the string. And now it prints like this here, line by line. It's also possible to iterate over a file, just like a loop. Open the file again here, and for a line in text file. So just like a looping of a list, you can actually loop over the lines in the text file. So for line of text file, it takes every line of the file and prints it out like this. And of course, we need more ways of reading files. Uh, so there's also a method called read lines that will read the entire file into a list where every uh, item in the list is a line in the file. So then you can see here, if I print that, you can see here the first item in the list is this one here, including the backslash n. Next item is the next row. So one thing I want to show you also is the, a way of um, don't having to call close all the time. So instead of using the close statement, you can use the with statement here. So with open as text file. This will also create the text file object. All the operations on the file you do in this indented block. And when you exit this block, close will automatically call on the file. So this, this will ensure that you always call close on the file. Um, so I'm error handling. Uh, so 
many times if you run something in Python, you will get this large blob of error messages. Uh, and when you program code, it's important that you think about what can happen. So for example, if I have my file of text and there is no file on disk and I want to read it, uh, you should check, does actually this file exist? And then you print out, I couldn't find the file. This, this construct with, with testing with it works perfectly fine if you have a smaller number of errors, but usually there can be different kinds of errors and you need to respond in different ways. Uh, if I run this one here, it says, it says couldn't find. You're still in control here, but it could be that um, the file is there, but you're not allowed to read it. Then it will go, okay, the file exists. I open the file and it boom, says, you're not allowed to read this file. That is not, a, that you don't take care of here, it will, it will crash. Uh, so Python has, uh, every error message you see uh, when you run your code is an exception. And the result of an exception is that it, uh, so if I do this here, you can see here that when I run this here, the file doesn't exist. And you see file not found error. This is the exception. File not found that is an object that is thrown out of the open statement. And here it has a traceback error, actually which line it is. And it says this is the output from the exception. No such file found in there. It would be good if you could catch those that are generating Python automatically. And you do that using something called exception handling. And that is done using the try and accept statements. So it's like, try this code here. If something happens, go here. Uh, this is a really general exception step. This will handle every error in Python. But, but it could be something else. It, it could be that it, the error is not this one, five, it couldn't find the five. It could actually be something else, but we don't know because we cached everything. So this is not a recommended way of doing it because uh, sometimes if you get an error here, nothing shown on the screen, just continues executing code, and you don't know what happens. So you need, the better way is actually to specify which exception you want to handle. And you do it like this. So for example, final found, try this code. If you get an exception final found error, do this. If you look, if of course, fail on other code. So if it's another exception, it will fail. But if you have exceptions that you need, you know what errors could happen, you can list them here after the exception. You can have multiple exceptions as well. So in this case here, I have accept final found. Then I print, I couldn't find a file. But if I'm not put in permissions for a file, I get a permissions error exception. And notice that we don't have the right to clean this file. So in this way, you can actually very controlled handle every error in Python. And also if, if the program crashes for some other reason with an exception, you can see which exception it was and you can add it to my to the list here. Uh, you can also, every exception is an object and it has some information attached to it. And sometimes it could be useful to, to actually query that and then you can add Find not found exception as E. So the actual exception of it will store in a variable called E. And for example, the find not found, there is a, a file name property which you can query. So you can actually see which file name you couldn't find. You can also query here E here. And usually there is a string error property as well that actually contains the error message. And you see here that it actually specifies which file. The problem was. And then finally, sometimes you have, if, for example, if you have a really complex program, it opens up the files or internet connections or something, and you get an exception. Uh, and you know that, okay, I have an exception, but I really should do some other cleanup as well. Then you can use the finally thing. So I have an exception here somewhere. Uh, I handle my exception or I don't handle my exception. But finally, this code will always be cool. So here I can close my files, for example, I can do some cleanup regardless of I have an exception or not. So this is a useful thing to do. So uh, we'll take 10 minutes break.
Now we continue with number. Uh, I... Okay, so let's continue. Uh, up until now, we have just doing basic Python. So that standard construct as a part of the, uh, the standard models of Python uh, and the language of Python. So as this is a scientific computing course, you need to be able to do scientific computing. And the, the, the lists and dictionaries have a lot of uses, but when it comes to processing large amounts of data, numeric data, we need some other tools. And to solve this, uh, many years ago, there, there was an initiative called Numeric that developed some of the foundations that today is the NumPy model. And the NumPy module is an extension uh, to Python. And extensions Python can be uh, modules, but usually they, they, they are uh, C compiled modules that provide a lot of computational power to Python. So NumPy is a C uh, extension. So it, it works like a normal module in Python, but all the functions are implemented in C and C++, I think, as well, uh, using very efficient uh, algorithms. So Anaconda, for example, the NumPy library is compiled using the Intel math kernel libraries. So it has really efficient math routines built in. Uh, and NumPy provides extensions for handle arrays uh, of different data types, vector matrices, uh, stuff like that, um, in multiple dimensions. Uh, you can combine uh, arrays from NumPy with dictionaries, for example. So there, there are ways of doing stuff like that. And, and that, in that case, it can be efficient. So using NumPy in your code, you need to import the NumPy extension and then the standard convention of doing that is not using the from syntax, but using the import numpy as np. Uh, that also makes sure that all the functions you import prefix with np, you can see directly this is a numpy function, or this is a numpy array. So this is uh, something I see uh, most Python code using numpy uses this convention. Start by importing it. The main Data type in, in, in NumPy is array objects. Uh, and uh, they are com compared to, to the lists that can create, you can add different data types. An array object uh, consists, consists of a single data type. So you have to choose if it should be a floating point or integer, a Boolean, or everything. But the entire array is the same data type. And they are allocated in memory as a single continuous block of data. That also makes it very efficient to, to, to work with. Uh, you create array objects by using the mp.array function. And here you have the first mp.array, that is the creation function. And then you just provide what you want the array to contain. In this case, I have a list of one, two, three. So this will create a one dimensional array with in, integer, uh, in this case, it's a floating point with the number one, two, and three. If I run this, it will print out like this. So you can see here that I specified that I wanted it to be float. And you can see if I print it out, it, it, there are decimal points to indicate that this is a NumPy array uh, floating point array. If you don't specify this argument here, uh, NumPy will automatically kind of figure out if there are only integers in this list, it will create an integer array. So all, all the data will be integer in this case. You see here that one through three here that indicates that these are integers and it's an integer array. Same thing here if you add create an array with floating point values here, it will figure out this is a floating point value. And as I said before, you can only have one data type for all of the values. So you can't mix and match integers and floating points. Either floating point, either integer. You can, of course, also create multi dimensional arrays. So, in this case, you specify a nested list here first row, second row. Uh, so, I think here this is a two row uh, array with 
four columns. You see, if you print this, they will print the same thing. You have a map lab, you have a race. It will print them out use, with the correct structure. So in this case, two by two, and this is two by four. Something about the story. So um, two-dimensional, three-dimensional race, that, that is not something that is actually a computer knows about. A computer knows about single continuous memory. So if you allocate an array, it actually stores the array as a single continuous block. And the, the structure of the array is actually something just redefines to, to kind of access the elements in the, in the longer array. So in this case here, for example, I have an array A. It's a five by, sorry, it's a six rows and five columns. Uh, and it's actually stored in memory like this. It's just like a one single continuous uh, list of, of floating point values. This is called, so you see it's stored row wise. That means you go row by row like this. This is a row wise storage. This is how. C and C++ store their arrays by default. Uh, if you're working with Fortran, uh, Fortran stores them column-wise like this. Working with the arrays like that. So array dimensions is just a way of accessing different positions in the one-dimensional block of memory. When you create arrays, you can. There is a lot of properties on this object that you can use to query different uh, properties. So in this case, shape here will actually uh, print the shape of the array. So if it's a one-dimensional array, it says that this is a uh, four elements here. If the two-dimensional says two by two. And if this this is actually three-dimensional data structure, so they have two by two by four. So shape you can query the, the sizes of the the race. Um, and you typically can use like this, for example, rows and columns, you do B dot shape. Then R is the number of rows, C is the number of columns. So if you want to loop over an array or something, you can query, get some variables assigned that has the rows and columns uh, by using the B dot shape. Uh, you can also query the number of dimensions in an array. So here I have two dimensions in the B array, which was correct. Yes, it's a two by two, so two dimensions. And there are some other things that you can do as well. So shape I've seen, number dimension. You can query the data type, which could be important for some cases. Size is the number of elements of the array in total. Item size, that actually the size of each element in bytes. Sometimes you need to know that if you want to store it on disk or anything, it's a nice query that. So you see here I have a B is two by two. Uh, it has two dimensions. It stores its data as integer 64, that is uh, 64 bits of integer. Uh, the array size is a total of four elements and every element is eight bytes. And you can see here that eight by eight is 64. So this is the number of bits for each element. Uh, you can use the reshape function to change the shape of the, of the array. And as long as you don't change the number of values in the array, uh, the, the data of the array is not lost. So one thing that NumPy is really good at is actually reusing memory. So it will almost tries to really long length not to reallocate memory. So using reshape will not uh, reallocate any memory. I have a, so this function here is not something you have to remember, but I create a function here that will show you the memory location of an array. So there is a special array interface here that will give you the memory of the array. It's just simplify it here, memory of will print the memory of an array. So I create an array A here. 
Uh, and I just check where is this array located? Where is the data? Then I do uh, a flat empty dot reshape a four by one. And then I check print out a flat and check where is the memory of a flat. You can see here, 3953A208. This one is 208. So actually, this is a reference uh, to uh, the same memory location of the values, but interpreted in a different way. So an array object, multiple array can have different views of the data at the same time. So when I do this one here, uh, they point to the same memory location, but this one is shaped differently. It's four by one. So it's uh, four rows like this and one column. This is two by two. So there are still four elements here and there are four elements, but interpreted in different ways. And also to be a bit careful, when you change the value in A flat, it will also change the value of, of A. So there is a connection. So it tries to avoid reallocation because you can, you can have really large arrays uh, and you don't want, in many cases, you don't want to reallocate it if it's not really required. So most of the operations will return references to existing data. And just to illustrate this here, what is happening here, you can see here, I changed the value zero, zero here. And you can also, this is also a thing to note with NumPy, indexing is starts by zero. So it's not like MATLAB that we index start at one. So the first row is zero, first column is zero. I assign zero by zero to 42, I print it out and you can see it's 42 here. It's also 42 in flat. So if you don't want that, you can use the same thing we did yesterday here with the copy. So C equals A dot copy. And if I do C zero zero A four, it should not affect A. And it doesn't. You can see here that this one is 84, this is 42. You can also see here, um, they have different memory addresses. So, So here I have a V array with two rows and four columns. I can reshape that to a single array uh, using a comma here. That will be, you can also do four by two. Uh, as long as the, the number of items doesn't change, it's perfectly fine to do this. But this is not the same as using transpose. So if you want to use a uh, transpose in array, there is actually a function here called mp.transpose that does the linear algebra transpose. This just reshapes it in a different order. You can see also there are different. Okay, so if you want to change the size of an array, there is also a function called resize. That will reallocate things. So if you have a two by two here, and uh, do resize base to nine by nine. Uh, resize will try to preserve as much as possible the contents of the new arrays here. So in this case here, nine by nine, but it actually reuses the content here, just copies it in the entire array. But it will react allocate memory. So up until now, the array function you can create smaller arrays with using this syntax, but in most cases you have to have really large arrays and you can't create them using by specifying them in code. So there are some functions here to create arrays as well. So this is probably you have recognized in MATLAB, mp.zeros will create a four by four matrix uh, with zeros. Uh, and by default, it will create a floating point array. If you want to specify a, a zero array with integers, you have to add data type as a second parameter. That will create an empty or zero array with integers. There is also 
array object consisting of once. The function is called once. It works the same way. And you have, yeah. If you want to assign values, this is actually a quick way to do it. You create a once array and you multiply it by a scalar value. And the nice thing with all the uh, array data types, if you use a mathematical operator like this between an array and a scalar, it will actually repeat this operation over every single element in the array. You can create ranges of uh, arrays as well, just like uh, the, the NumPy range function. You can use a range for array range to create ranges of values like this. So from zero to nine, same uh, notation here that it goes up, not, not including 10. So zero to nine. Now you can combine uh, a range, an array range with V shape to create. So, for example, if I want a array that is 10 by 10, starting from zero, going to 99, I can create an A range of 100 and reshape it to 10 by 10. This does not reallocate anything, just a different interpretation of an of a array range from zero to 99. Like this. Uh, it's also possible, just like with the uh, the range in Python, you can do starting uh, endpoint data type. You can also have a step, how much step you should move. So now we go from minus 10 up until 9. Here we go from minus 10 uh, to 10 with a step of 2. Yeah, and of course, you can add this data type function here as well. You can create identity arrays using the identity function. So you will get the one here on the diagonal. Uh, so if you want to create uh, ranges with a linear variation, so range is not very well suited. It will create, uh, it's not totally sure if you get everything in the array. Uh, so there is a better function if you want to really make sure that, for example, I want a range that goes from zero to one, and both of these values should be included, and I want an array size of 10. It would create a, interpolate values between zero and one and return an array with those. You can see here that it will create zero is included, one is included, uh, here is zero, one year, but have 20 values instead. These are typically well when you're going to plot or do function, calculate function values, use link space instead of a range. Array expressions. So I created a range here, this is just for illustration. I have created an array of a five by five with numbers just. Uh, continues here. Um, the nice thing with NumPy is that most ordinary operations on, on the arrays work. So in this case, I have an array. I have a scalar value of three. And if I do this addition, it will add three to all elements in, in the array. Same thing goes for multiplication. We'll multiply all elements by three. You can also do math functions, for example. So if I do sign and an array here, it will compute the sign of all values in this array. And these, these are really fast functions. So they're implemented in C. So, you, so you, as long as you don't loop in NumPy, things will be fast. Uh, of course, you can, if you do, uh, minus operator here, it will negate the values in, in the array. You can do add here, a plus a with element wise addition. And also, the array sizes doesn't have to be the same. So if you have a and b and a and b, you do a plus b, 
it will repeat the values and continue operating. So uh, in this case, it will be repeat, re repeat the value here when you do stuff like that. So all, all the previous operators here, not, if you use array objects and you do plus minus uh, multiplication and division, it's element-wise operations. So if you want to do linear algebra, uh, you want to do ma matrix multiplication, for example, uh, you can't use the, the normal multiplication operator. Uh, you can use the dot operator or the at operator. So in this case, I have um, four by four. Uh, and I do a dot a that is a multiplied by a. So the, these operations are equivalent. This is probably more useful if you want to make here that is you know, create a more complicated expression, but this is uh, easier to work with. A nesting function like this. There is also a data type called matrix, uh, which has some of the uh, methods of a uh, so it has a built-in transpose operator and uh, inverse, but they are deprecating this, this um, object type. So it's better to use arrays and use these operators here to do linear algebra. So slicing and indexing. So as I said before, uh, you index here using the square brackets here, and uh, indexing starts at zero. So this is the third element. Um, and then if you have two-dimensional arrays, you can either use two brackets like this, just like we do with the nested lists. But you can also do this square with a comma here, so you get more, uh, looks better in notation marks here. Assigning values to an array is just, just like you use lists or uh, dictionaries. You give it an index here and you assign a value and it will assign a value to that position. Same thing, and this is a uh, row two, column three, we'll have this value. Here. You can also use index notation like we did before with lists. So in this case, you have start and end. So this will get us uh, an array that some array that has start with a start index here and uh, includes n minus one. So this is from start to the end, uh, up to the end, all values. It's a bit similar to what you have in, in uh, MATLAB as well. So here you have a start at from one to, but not including five, so one, two, three, and four. Uh, also, indexes knows that when you do slicing, the data behind the slice is actually referring to the original. So, if you create an array and you get a slice of an array, it's just a view of the original data. And we can see here, I create an A here, which runs five elements, print out the memory, and print out the data here. And do the same, and then I do a B equals to the slice of A. And then I print out the same thing here, and I change things like this to see what we we'll see what happens here. First, you see here memory of A that is uh, something uh, three, four, six, four. And we have this is the actual memory location of the original data here. Then we do B slice. Uh, and you can see here it's a bit different than memory but it belongs to the same code block. So this is just a different position in the memory, but this here is actual memory in the computer. And those are the same. So B is actually a view of this code, this data block. And you can also see here, if I if you modify B here, it modifies both the arrays. Yeah, and here are some examples of uh, uh, different indexing here. So here are all elements except the last, all except the last two, last element of A. So it's very similar to what we did yesterday with the last lecture. Uh, with, here you can also do steps. 
and you can do it in a reverse order here as well. So this is all elements, and this is step minus one, but we re reverse the rest. And you can do this in multiple dimensions as well. So you can have all rows in column zero, all rows in column zero and one, uh, rows row zero, rows zero to one, last row in B, last column in B, every other row in B, every other column in B. So it's it's quite powerful to extract subarrays like this. Another thing that is very useful is that uh, there's no you don't you don't have to assign an array with another array. So if you want to assign values, for example, to a, a column or row, you can actually specify them in a list like this. So you don't have to put an np dot array here and pray, but you can actually use lists for assignments. And it that, that looks kind of nicer in, in the code as well. It's more readable. And there's no big for smaller things like this, there's no efficiency problems with that. Right? So here you can see I have a sign um, row one. So the second row here like this, and the column here like this. There are some nice functions you can use as well on the array objects. So you have um, A here, and I can do sum, and it will sum um, the array. So that's a great total sum. You can also sum in columns or rows by specifying zero or one as the argument to the sum function. And you get an array back. Same thing with the, you can crack a product as well using the prod function method. So you get a bit larger numbers here. And same thing here, you can do prod zero, prod one, and you get the products of rows and columns as well. I will just show you the matrix objects shortly here. So matrix is uh, an array data specialization. So it, it inherits all the inherited properties of an array. Uh, but you can only do uh, two-dimensional uh, matrices for this. Uh, the nice thing with matrix is that it actually has some of the notations for linear algebra built in. So you can do a dot t, that is a trans, uh, matrix transponate. Then you can do matrix multiply using the normal multiplication operator. And there is an a dot i for the inverse of the matrix that's built into that. So, but yeah, so, so suppose you're working with these arrays and you want to get data in and get that data out. Uh, and you can, by default, there is a, the number has its own binary formats for MPY or MPZ, uh, which you can use to write down scratch arrays or stuff like that to store on, on disk. You can also um, read text files with row by row, and you can also directly read and write binary files. So I will show how to use the MPY files. It's a bit similar to the map files in Python. So I created two variables x and y here. Uh, and then I can just do np.save file name of x, x uh, y of npy, and it saves those arrays, single arrays to the file. So let's see here. Just ls, you can see here that I have now two files on disk here, x and y and y and y. And then I can, if I plot them out, you can see here, these are not your standard text files. So these are uh, binary files. So the floating point of store very compactly in these files, very efficient. Reading is very simple as well. So uh, you load here your files. You create an array X, load, create an array Y. And they should be the same. So just to see if I get the same thing, I uh, import a map.pyplot library here so we can plot the values. 
heresies. I, I read into values here. Um, so those were single arrays. But how do you store, for example, multiple files, multiple arrays in a, in a file? Um, very easy. So you, same thing, same variables here. I open an XY, that's fine. But instead of just doing W, I do WP, which stands for W write binary as if. Uh, and then I can, instead of specifying a file name to the save method here in NumPy, I can just give the file pointer here over and it will write the X array to this file in binary form. Same thing here, I give, continue giving the F object here, it will continue in that file. And I write Y, I will just take directly after X, it will write Y binary. And same thing here again, when you open it, read binary, load F, you have to uh, load them in the same order as you wrote them. So in this case, at first I read X, and then I read Y. And hopefully we should get back the same thing. And we did. So we stored them, read them back, and plot them and we got the same plot. These files are very quick. So they're also implemented in C in the extension library. So before implementing your own looping over your uh, arrays to save them to disk, this is a way of doing it quickly. Especially it's well suited if you have, for example, do, if you do some checkpointing in your codes, you want to stop your calculation, you can save out all the arrays as a state file and wheel it back again. So those, those MPY and MPC are very efficient. So suppose you want to read text files. So I have here a data file here uh, containing uh, vector data. Um, it looks like this in the format, the simplified. It has some uh, header files here that, that, that says the defines the columns here. There is some other information here. But if we are not interested in kind of this, we want to get all that data here into the array. Um, we can do that. So in NumPy, there is a function called load text that will load a text file. And there's an option here. So because the, the first lines of this file uh, contained header information. So we can tell NumPy, skip those lines, read other things here. So then we can see here what the shape is and uh, also check that the, the first row is correct. So this is a large file. And you can see here that it contains 299,520 rows and six columns. And you can see zero, 0107 zero, seven something. You can see if that checks out. Yeah, it seems to fit the first row. So also here, if you have a text file, if it fits to this kind of uh, row by uh, line set of value separated list like this, uh, the load text is really fast to load text files. And it also does all the translation for you. It reads all the converts all the floating point to floating point values. You don't have to do that in fact in Python either. And you can do this, the opposite around as well. So you can actually save text. Let's see what happens on this one. So you can see here that I have a So this, this dumps uh, uh, 10 rows, four columns, or you can see here, that writes the data in as high precision as possible to a text file. You can also specify here, the limiter here, what should uh, be between the, the numbers. So by default, it uses space, but if you want a comma, you can do that as well. You can then you set the limit to comma, you run that one. You can see here if you go that it has comma signs here instead of spaces. You can also specify a format separate. So if you don't want to have the full precision here, uh, you want to have a 
just four decimal numbers, you can actually specify which format it should use. So this is the number, uh, four, um, four decimals on this fixed floating point. So let's see here. We get this output instead. And of course, you can do header and footer as well. So it will add a text row on the top and a footer below. Here, this is the So if you can try use it, use these files because we use this method, these are fast. So you can also write and read binary files. So in this case here, I will uh, I have here an uh, image file that is located somewhere here. It is a PNG file. Um, what I do here first, I just make sure that I don't have any PG files before, then I download it. So I want to read this file into an array. Then there is a special library called ImageIO, which can read an image and interpret that as an array. So let's see what, what comes out here. So you can see here that this is a file uh, for k uh, looks like this, and it's 359 by 500 by three. So these are the color components, and every item in this uh, array is of type U in eight. So you can see that we created an array, but it's not the floating point or not the integer, but it's actually the same data type as it's stored inside the image. So unsigned integer eight. So what can we do with this file? Uh, you can write this as a binary file to disk uh, using the two file here. So every array has this two file, then it can save this as a raw image to disk. So now it's a bit bigger because I think the PV format has some, some kind of compression. So now it's 500 bytes. So this is the raw image file. So I can read that back into memory again. So this raw file here, and then if, if you have a, a binary file that consists of u in eight, which this case does, you can specify, I want to read this file here, and I know that the data type is u in eight, and we will create this again from the file. So now you see here, uh, I have a, because it doesn't know the shape now, this is a raw just dump of data. So in comes 538,500 U in So let's use our knowledge here. So if we want to reshape it back to the image, we can use reshape here. Okay, 359 by 500 by three. That should recreate the image array again. And hopefully we should get an image. And we can plot that with image radio. So now I see here. So there are also built in things, the functions for writing and reading binary data. You can also read data from uh, URLs on the web. So in this case, you can use something called a data source. And, uh, and then you can use GS open. And then instead of specifying a file locally, you can say, I want to open this file here that is located on the web here. Uh, I want to read binary. Uh, I can print the absolute path. Uh, and I can convert it into the image, which I can plot. So now we, you can see here that I, it's located now here in my local directory like this. And if I plot this using the in show command on the map plot, I get this image here. So this way you can actually open files directly on the web. 
load them to your local code and display them. So, also important thing to do with NumPy, you can solve uh, equation systems. And in NumPy, there is a module called Linal, which contains uh, a simple linear algebra solver. So, if I have an A matrix, B matrix, I can use Linal and solve A, comma B. Then there, if you want more algorithms, there is this um, package called SciPy, which also contains, it's built on NumPy, but has all the algorithms, so a lot of scientific algorithms that could be useful to as well. I will not go through this course. I, uh, it's, when you know NumPy, it's very easy to use the SciPy libraries as well. So I think I will end there and I will go through map the next lecture. So it's